Yeah. Um, so our, I guess next, our next speaker is yeah. David Spivak. Um, can you put up your, get your slide? I think so. Okay. And is going to talk to us today on internal probability valuations. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, thanks for, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the invitation, Tobias and Rory, and um, I've really enjoyed the talks so far. So this is joint work with Tobias. Um, and it's kind of work in, it's work in progress. It should be finished somewhat soon, but uh, take especially the last section, uh, the sum results section with a small grain of salt. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm interested in what the mathematical structure of story is. It seems to me that maybe every thought I have is a story snippet in some sense. Um, we'll, every slide here on this talk will be a story snippet. Uh, if you think about the events of your day, they form a story, or if you, some, someone's telling you about a chess game or a go game, they're telling you a story. And um, uh, scientific facts like every protein apparently vibrates at the frequency of the light it absorbs, and you can use that to study the vibrational patterns of pr proteins, which tells you about how they interact um, with other proteins. And somehow this one reminds me of like a talk. Maybe you'll, you, you'll vibrate with this talk at the frequency that you can anyway. So how information moves through stories is really interesting to me. Um, and I have no idea what the mathematical structure of stories should be, but just for something crude, um, we could imagine uh, that stories take place in time and space, at least for humans and our brains, we wanna think that way. So um, abstracting, um, instead of time and space, let's just think about sheaves on a topological space. And if you don't know what those are, I'll, I'll remind you later. But basically a sheaf S would be this world of story snippets. Um, and those story snippets would be called sections, like sections of the story. Uh, every story snippet like this slide is occurring in some part of space time, although maybe Zoom makes that less obvious what space time should be. But, um, but uh, just classically, maybe you would just think every story snippet occurs in some part of space time. But the question for today is what would be meant by characters in this story? In, uh, from a, this mathematical perspective. Um, and so I want to think of the characters in a story, um, sorry, I should say characters in the story are, are, the sh are sheaves. So a character uh, has two things. First of all, it has some kind of body. And by body, I mean what its expressive possibilities are, like the fact that I can talk or move, uh, look around, etc. These um, possibilities of what I can do form a sheaf. Um, and, but more importantly, or maybe more interestingly, is that it has characteristic behaviors. That out of all the things I can do, uh, uh, some patterns of behavior are more likely than others. And so I want to think of the character's expressive possibilities, what it can possibly do as a sheaf. Um, it's a world of story snippets. So uh, all the words that I have, all the morphemes, ph phonemes I have are, um, are little snippets of what my, my voice can do, but when we put them together, uh, that, that's what sheaves are for, so kind of taking story snippets and putting them together. Uh, and maybe characters interact through relations, which would be sub-objects and products in the usual sense, but it also sounds right. Characters interact with each other through relations. So, um, but to have characteristic patterns, the body, what I'm capable of doing needs to have some notion of tendency or propensity or likelihood or probability, um, and that's super important because it's only using the no our knowledge of tendencies and propensities that we're actually able to do anything. So, uh, um, previous work of mine that I'll get to a little in a little bit that won't be very relevant today was about um, thinking about what behaviors are possible, but that really doesn't go very far towards really understanding the world. You need to understand what's probable. Um, so this is kind of what stochastic processes were invented for. And I'll, uh, disc that'll be mainly the, the topic of today is our own version, uh, that of Tobias, Tobias and I um, on, uh, on doing this for sheaves. Okay, so my running example um, is Go. Uh, if you don't know what Go is, um, it's, a, it's a really great game because it, um, it only has very simple rules. And the rules are that if you surround a, a group, then you take it off the board but we don't even need that for today. The board, what, what, what we need is that um, the board has some number of intersection points. Um, 
361 to be precise. And every one of those 19 by 19 points gets either black, white, or a vacancy. And here you can see a picture. And so by board positions BP, I mean the set of all possible ways of filling 19 by 19 with one of three uh, colors. And some sequences are legal, namely you can't play five times in a row. Um, if you surround something, you take it off the board, blah, 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 there are some rules. And so some sequences in board positions are legal. The overarching space time that I'm talking about here is that of rectangles. Um, so we'll just be looking at space. Um, I'll make that precise in a little while. And the character of Go is what's taking place in space. And those will be the legal sequences of moves. So that's uh, the character's body, what's possible. And then finally, propensity will be that some sequences occur more often than others. And I'll make that precise also a little later. Um, so feel free to interrupt as I go along, by the way, just open your mic and talk. Uh, so this thing I said where some, some sequences occur more than others, what do we mean by that? Well, note that on the whole three to the 19 by 19, you're never gonna see the same sequence twice unless someone's be playing a game. Um, Just what, a quick question about uh, occur more than others. Are you talking about an usual play or an optimal play or just an all allowed sequences? I guess I'll say an optimal play. Thanks for the question, yeah. Um, or in expert play or in, um, yeah, maybe you could even do in all games that have ever been played. But uh, right, we need to define that. And those might be three different valuations, the three different things I've just said. Anyway, so uh, some, what do we mean? On this whole board, you never see the same sequence twice. So when someone says that some things are more common than others, they're talking about local patterns. And here's a local pattern that you might see. Um, so on the left frame there, white has just jumped into black's territory. That's how it feels when you're playing Go. Um, and black says, uh, well, you're not moving to the left. And moreover, I'm attaching to you. So like, this doesn't feel very good. And white says, well, I'm feeling okay. I'll, I'll, I'll move forward and extend a little bit. And then black, they call it hit on the head, but um, it kind of um, blocks white from extending very well forward. And so this is a, a sequence that you might see um, in a Go game. And it's entirely local in the sense that you, we can describe this situation and, and in, be interested in it in a Go game without knowing what's happening in the rest of the 19 by 19 board. Um, the rest of the 19 by 19 board affects it, but you don't have to think about the entire board. Uh, so if I want to say, how good is this? If I ask a professional, hey, was this good? Um, well, they can, they can just tell me locally, this looks fine. Uh, and and that's, that's the sort of thing that you get better at is understanding local situations in more and more context of the whole board. Uh, but I wanna talk about stochastic processes just because these are, what I'm talking about in this talk are, is related. Um, so before we go on to the main point, I just wanna uh, talk about how, that, how it relates slightly. So Alexander Kinchin uh, invented stochastic processes in the 30s to model similar types of things, namely, behavior changing in time and its characteristic propensities. Uh, so for example, a random or a not so random walk, we wanna be able to talk about how it kind of behaves through time. But for example, uh, the prob outside of Go, you would see this all the time. You would see um, the probability of rain, for example, in some region changes through time. And you could say, what's the probability that it's raining? And think of that as just a standalone event. The chance it's raining on second X could just be you look at the time of day and the season and you get a number but you might want to encode that events at time t and events at time t plus one are correlated if you're if it's raining at time one and three it's probably raining at time two um, and so that's what correlations that's what stochastic processes are supposed to encode are these correlations across time so as an example here's two different probability distributions on all functions from r to r in the first one there's a 50 50 chance 50% of the time, f of x is just x for all x. So just imagine 50% of the time, we're gonna have just the diagonal line. And the other 50% of the time, we're gonna have the x equals, uh, y equals zero line. Um, and those are completely correlated in the sense that if you notice that f of three is three, then you know that f of four will be four. Um, whereas in the second example, for all time uh, x, it's the case that for 50% of those times x, 
uh, it's f of x is x and 50% f of x is zero. Well, now if you know the time, that at time pi um, f of x was x, then at time 3.14, which is completely different, you have no idea if it's x or zero. Okay, so this is, uh, I, by the way, I'm not at all an expert on stochastic processes, so this is kind of how I think of them in my very naive way. So our approach is not to exactly try to implement uh, stochastic processes categorically, but to do what we think they may have been seeking, which is to just think about, you know, a way of telling stories about more general characters. Um, uh, being able to talk about correlations through time or, or space or whatever of, of, um, of sheaves or of story snippets. So the preview of the rest of the talk is that I'll define topological spaces and valuations internally to a topos of sheaves. And uh, I'll, I'll remind you what that means or tell you what that means. Um, and that topological space, once we define it inside the side of the sheaves, topos, the topological space will tell us what the expressive possibilities are of our character and the valuation will tell us what its propensities and likelihoods are. And by doing this internally, which um, again, I'll say what that means, we, the, these ideas are somehow going to vary over t. And to be satisfied with this definition, we want that however we define valuations, that we're going to be able to work with them logically uh, and understand what they mean semantically. Okay, so again, this running example, um, the space, the space time is going to be called Go with the topology O sub Go. And it says that Go, the points, and this is, might be confusing at first, the points here are not the 19 by 19 points, but those and all rectangles. So all non-empty rectangles of this board, like A1 through D3, I don't know, I think you can see my cursor. This little part of the board uh, over here is a point, not just a rectangle, not just a subboard. And so those are the points of my weird space. And a basic open will be some, well, a rectangle again. And what points it will contain are all the sub rectangles of that rectangle. So I just want the topology generated by those, by those basic open sets. Now about that topology, it's not T1 because you can't separate points. Um, if I have a two different rectangles, if one is contained in the other, then um, every set containing, every open containing the bigger one contains a smaller one too. So I can't find an open containing the bigger one, but not the smaller one. Uh, and I'm gonna write this square subset thing to reverse the order. Um, it just says that uh, you would say that R uh, is less specific than R prime or that R prime is a specialization of R. It just means that every open containing R also contains R prime. Um, so Go is a domain, if you know what that is, a continuous post set. I also want to um, note that um, the open defined by R, union the open defined by R prime, is not necessarily the open defined by R union R prime. For example, if I take the open for this snippet here, for the, sorry, for this rectangle there, uh, union with the open for this rectangle here, then neither of them contains the big rectangle. Um, neither of those opens contains the big rectangle. Okay, whereas U of the big rectangle would. Okay. So this was, there's another example besides Go that I'm gonna to refer to a couple of times, namely what I call temporal type theory. So this is at least my, but I think both uh, Tobias and my original motivation was to think about behavior types and how they would help us think about stochastic processes. So a behavior type is just uh, a story snippet that can occur over a standard, a standard notion of time in some sense. So here, IR, the interval reals, is the space whose points are closed intervals, like 0, 5, and whose basic opens are all closed intervals contained in some open interval. So it's very similar to what we just saw. There's just more reals than there are points in a Go board, so a little bit more is happening. Um, but basically, if you fix an open like 0, 10, then you look at all closed intervals strictly between 0 and 10. And this one has some non-trivial covers. 
some interesting covers, namely uh, the interval from zero to 10 as an open is covered by the intervals uh, like 0.1 to 9.9 .9 and growing um, even with this kind of funny notion of points, which are these rectangles, sorry, which are these uh, closed intervals. Can I ask a question at this point? Mm, uh, yes. So uh, in terms of the goal, is there any temporal aspect to the way the play develops? Is that a part of Well, uh, temporal in the sense of a timeline, um, yes. So uh, I'm not sure if I know what you mean, but- well, um, In the, uh, the sequence of moves. Oh, in the, in the Go game? Yeah. Oh yes, we'll get, so so far we're lo just looking at space time in some sense, and here we're looking at space, and yeah. here we're more looking at time, yes. but in a few slides, well, I don't oh, know. Oh, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> we'll be getting to the actual character of a Go game itself. Yeah. Um, in temporal type theory, there's a book that talks about behaviors through time, and, um, and there we, my co-author Patrick Schultz and I more talk about a quotient of this IR thing that uh, enforces a kind of stationarity that says that what you can do between the interval zero and uh, time zero and four is exactly what you're able to do between one and five. Like there's no, nothing new in terms of capability, um, but I'm not gonna talk about that today. So again, you might notice that um, some kind of uh, similarity between IR and Go, this order on points, some points are contained in others. And you might, someone might ask, well, why not just take the reals instead of IR? And you can, it's just that we'll see that valuations on reals are kind of boring. Okay, so for the remainder of my time, I'll explain briefly what it means to work internally to a topos. I'll internally define topological spaces, lower reals and valuations. And then I'll talk about some mostly proven theorems and conjectures. Okay. Um, so given a topological space T, like the space of rectangles on the Go board, a sheaf assigns to every open set of your space a set, the set of possibilities, what can happen on that rectangle. So I might say they, they're called sections, but you could also call them story snippets. Um, uh, for every open, what's possible there? And when I have a sub open, I should be able to take any story snippet on the big thing you know, the bigger interval of time or the bigger rectangle and restrict it or clip that story to just tell you what's happening on the smaller interval of time. And that's called restriction, restriction of the story or clipping. Um, and a sheaf satisfies a further gluing condition that says that if you have a story over one part of time and another part of time, a different story, and you notice that on the overlap, the exact same thing was happening, then you could glue those story snippets to a longer story. Uh, amorphism of sheaves is just a natural transformation. What that means is that for every open set, you have these two different sheaves, X and Y, and so therefore on the open set, you have two different sets, X of that open and Y of that open, and you have a map between them. And that map, all those maps for open sets commute with the restriction maps. You can restrict and then apply alpha or apply alpha then restrict. Now, um, what you get is a topos, and I'll to say what that means soon. People have been saying it throughout this, uh, workshop. Um, but I wanted to mention that if you replace the word open throughout the definition above with basic open, if you have some basis, then the resulting category of sheaves um, would be equivalent. You could just literally word for word, wherever you see open, put basic open and get a different uh, notion that turned out to be equivalent. And so for Go, because our basic opens were so simple, um, the rectangles, it turns out that when I talk about sheaves on Go, you can just think of it as functors from the rectangles with, with um, um, specialization to set. So it's just for every rectangle, you get a set. And for every smaller rectangle, you can clip to, a, to um, give a function. So sheaf toposes are really great. The reason everyone's talking about them and saying they're such convenient categories is that they have very powerful reasoning capabilities whereas a lot of other categories don't. So it has a sheaf category, um, has all limits and co-limits. Um, it's also Cartesian closed, meaning that uh, if you have two sheaves, then the HOM set between them actually is a whole HOM sheaf. Um, so that means you can continually remain in sheaves, even though you're doing all sorts of operations that feel set theoretic. 
Another thing that we think about sets having is a natural numbers object. Um, those are the natural numbers are useful for thinking about numerical things like rationals and reals. And indeed, you can define rationals and reals from the natural numbers. But it's also what we use whenever we talk about induction. Um, there is this base case zero and the successor thing from naturals to naturals and um, anything else with a, a, a choice of a first point in it and away from of going from itself to itself will give you a notion of induction. And lastly, there's this uh, a topos has something called a sub object classifier, which is a notion of truth value. So in sets, we have two truth values, true and false. But uh, in an arbitrary topos, we have more truth values. This is like a big kind of a uh, long idea in the sense it takes up a lot of slide here. But it's an object called prop, like proposition, or maybe even property, um, and a map from one to prop called true. Let's say proposition. So there's a notion of truth, and all possible truth values are prop for this topos, and, top, and true is the highest one. Um, and basically, what it says is, well, first of all, any map out of one is automatically monic. You could ju it's just find from the definition. And the pullback of monomorphisms is a monomorphism. So when I pull this true thing back along any f, I get a monomorphism. And if that process is invert is an iso, then it's called a then prop is called a subobject classifier. What it means is, if I have a subset of B, I can get a function from B to true false that just sends everything the true in the subset to true and everything outside the subset to false. And I can recover my subset as those things that went to true, obviously. Um, but uh, in general, you can do this for arbitrary toposes and say that if I have any subobject, I can understand it as a map from B to prop. Um, okay. So what that lets you do is that just like true false uh, in sets are the subobject classifier there, and they're the things that let you do logic, like and or implies exists for all. In the same sense, we can do logic in an arbitrary topos using this thing called prop. And if prop is supposed to be in an arbitrary topos like sheaves on T, then it has to be a sheaf. So what sheaf is it? It's the sheaf that takes any open and the set it gives that open is all open subsets. So it assigns to you the set of all open subsets of you. And what's going on there is that that is telling you about logic in the sense that true, the top thing, assigns the biggest open, biggest open subset of you, namely you itself. Bot uh, assigns the empty subset of you and assigns intersection or assigns union implies not they all make sense so exists is kind of like union a uh, big union and all the logical operations become operations on open subsets so when you think of and or implies etc those are all making sense in an arbitrary topos but they're talking about how open sets uh work if you're interested in more um a gentle introduction you could look at a book called seven sketches or if you're looking for a more um, rigorous treatment with lots of great theorems and, and insights, I also suggest uh, Ingo Blechschmidt's thesis. Um, so what this is saying, and it's really amazing, is that in a topos, you can talk as though you're talking about ordinary sets. And for example, in Boss Spitter's talk, he said, someone said, do you mean a set internal to the topos? And he said, yes, which really means when you talk about sets, there's like this dog whistle that means you're actually talking about sheaves. So in, po in politics, if you're not a native speaker, dog whistle politics is about language that sounds innocuous, but certain listeners hear extra content in it. And in the same way, um, all of the stuff we can say about sets, we're going to talk as though we're talking about sets, but with those with sheaf ears are actually hearing us saying statements about sheaves. They are statements that literally uh, kind of compile into statements in the sheaf topos. Uh, the last thing I need to tell you about logic is something called a modality. And a modality is a map from prop to prop um, that, that's kind of a closure operation. Uh, it takes any prop, um, say open set, and returns some slightly bigger open set, j of it, jp, 
Uh, but if I do this operation twice, it's the same as doing it once, and this operation commutes with and, or equivalently, this operation is monotonic. So it's not too bad. It's just some kind of closure operator that's monotonic. And what's amazing is that there's a, an equivalence between subtoposes and modalities. Modalities are just these logical thingies, whereas subtoposes are subcategories with um, an adjunction and all sorts of like fancy things. Uh, and so this is a neat theorem. Um, so for any open or closed subset of a topological space or any point of the topological space, uh, you'll get a subtopos and therefore you'll get one of these modalities, J, a, a closure operator. Um, so every subspace has its own J. And for today, uh, the, the subspace that we'll be most interested is in are those for a point. Um, Can I quickly ask? Yeah. Those axioms look structurally a lot like uh, a monad. Yes, it's an internal monad on prop. Okay. So prop is an internal, prop it has its own order. And these are saying that J is a, um, um, is a monad on prop uh, that is internal to the, that is enriched in the category, kind of. Yeah, great question. Um, okay, so if I wanna take, a, if I take a formula and I add J throughout, what I mean by that is you take a formula like this crazy thing here, I just made something up, and you just hit it with J every single place. J, 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 J. And when you do that to a formula, I mean, a lot of those J's can actually disappear because of these axioms, but it's easier just to think at first, you just hit it with J everywhere. And when you do that, it makes the formula talk about the J subtopos. So if J is referring to a point and you hit your formula with J everywhere, then now uh, that new formula will hold in your topos, your big topos, if and only if the formula the original formula holds at the point. So we're able to talk about whether phi holds at various points or open subsets, et cetera, by asking whether this like jade or added formula holds, um, holds in the regular old topos sheaves of T. Okay, so uh, let's talk about internal spaces, lower reals and valuations. Um, so what I just said is you can talk uh, about topological spaces as though you're talking about sets. And then the dog whistle will make that thing you say be about sheaves. So an internal topological space is a sheaf, but we think of it like it's a set X and a sub object O of X of all subsets of X. So the O of X will be the open subsets such that X is an O of X, the empty set is an O of X for all U and V in O of X, uh, if U and V are open, then U intersect V is open. And for all subsets of O of X, all subsets of open, the union over all elements of that S is again open. So each of these has a logical counterpart. This one would be that true is in O of X. This one would be that false is in O of X. This one would be that and of two things in O of X are in O of X. Uh, this last one would be about exists. But the point is that we've take the standard definition we hit it with our sheaf whistle, and now it's talking about sheaves. And we wonder, well, great, you, you're talking about sheaves, but does it mean anything? Like, what is this? Um, and so Ika Mordike in a paper called Spaced Spaces gave the semantics of this construction. And if you're familiar with, um, with sheaves, you'll know that sheaves have any tall bundle associated to them and um, Basically, sections of that bundle are the sections of the sheaf. So that's maybe where the term comes from. And Mordike proves that a topology on X is the same thing as a coarsening of the kind of discrete a tall thing to this blue guy here. So by coarsening, I mean they're just a map of spaces that's identity on points. And this is slightly coarser. It has fewer open sets. Um, and the open sets of this guy correspond to the um, elements of O of X, the opens O. You don't have to remember this. Um, it's not going to be useful for people who don't know much about sheaves. Um, this will be more useful, I think. So um, what is the internal space or character we're going to look at for Go? Well, every spot is either black, white, or vacant on a Go board, in a Go game. And for every rectangle, 
uh, what we could do is take a sheaf called pos that assigns to that open set or the rectangle all functions from R to black white vacant. So um, here's a function from a certain uh, rectangle O14 to T19 um, and an assignment of black white and vacant to all the intersection points there. But more interesting than pos as a sheaf is seek which are legal sequences of moves, um, a list that starts empty and that every sequence, every move fills a vacancy, um, that would be a, uh, an, uh, an element of seek on, on some rectangle. And now we need to put a topology on it, but I'm just gonna kind of make an easy one, which is that I'll order seek by the list prefix. So the first two is less than the first three, which is less than the first four, et cetera. And then I'll just use the Alexandrov topology so that a basic open will be um, the set of all futures of a given sequence. So you take this sequence of one, two, three, and you look at all futures of it, or this six element sequence and all futures of that, and those would be the opens. Okay, so, um, so an open set is the futures for a given sequence. And what we're gonna do is we're going to define valuations, which are like probability distributions, internally to the topos. We're gonna to just write down the set definition and then have it blow our sheaf whistle and have that set definition be talking about sheaves. So um, evaluation is gonna be a map from O of X, that sheaf, to zero one, that sheaf, except I haven't told you what zero one is yet. So O of X is defined by you, the um, person using this, I, these ideas as a topology, whereas O of zero one is gonna be something that uh, comes to us from what are called the lower reals, which Boss uh, uh, also talked about today. Was that today? Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, we're gonna discuss the semantics of lower reals and um, the interval zero one is just a subsheaf of R. And so I'll finish this section by telling you the definition of valuation. So uh, Dedekind in 1872 defined the real numbers uh, set theoretically in terms of pairs of cuts, subsets of Q times Q, of uh, all rationals that are less than your real and all rationals that are bigger than your real, but that is what the real is, is those lower bounds and those upper bounds. What's amazing is that when you take his definition and you blow the sheaf whistle um, and you see what happens, his definition, unlike Cauchy's, Cauchy's gives you something different, but his gives you what the most uh, beautiful thing. So um, Eduardo Dubuc, citing Joel, uh, shows in a paper that um, when you define internally using Dedekind's axioms, uh, uh, this sheaf, you get this sheaf of all continuous functions from your topological space to the reals. So if your topological space was just a point, then sheaves on that point are just sets. And we could be talking about set theory and there we would say that Dedekind's axioms turn out to be all continuous maps from a point to the reals, which are exactly the reals. So it recovers Dedekind's, Dedekind's reals in the case that your point, space is a point, but it more generally does the right thing. And this is considered evidence that the internal language really works. Um, um, you write something down in set theory and the sheaf, blow the sheaf whistle and you get something neat. So we'll use something similar called lower reals, which are just one cut. It's a function from Q to prop, and I'm writing it R sub greater than for intuition, but this is just a symbol. And uh, it's got three axioms written in the logic. These are written logically, but they're about subsets of um, a sheaf topos. So um, open subsets. So it says there exists a Q where R is bigger than Q. For every two rationals, if R is bigger than Q prime and Q prime is bigger than Q, then R is bigger than Q. And if R is bigger than Q, then there's some slightly bigger rational that R is also bigger than. And you write those down and you ask what they mean. Oh, and so what this is saying is that the real number is defined by its set of rational lower bounds. And so from this, you can define uh, rationals as reals by just saying a rational is all of its lower bounds. Um, you can define what it means for one real to be less than another. You would just say all lo rational lower bounds of R are rational lower bounds of R prime. You can define addition by saying that a rational is a lower bound for R1 plus R2. 
if it's the sum of two rationals, one of which is the lower bound for R1 and one of which is the lower bound for R2. And from this, you can just prove internally using just logic that this forms a commutative monoid. But, what's, but the point is that once we blow our sheaf whistle, uh, this stuff is actually talking about sheaves. And what sheaf is it? It's the sheaf of lower semi-continuous functions to R. Or another way is to say it's all continuous functions from U to a kind of funny topology on the reals, where you say that a subset of the reals is open if it's all numbers bigger than pi or all numbers bigger than six, those are opens. So, um, so by just defining the lower reals this way internally and blowing the dog whistle, sheaf whistle thing, we get, um, we get this very nice semantic topos, a uh, semantic um, sheaf here. Semantic just means thinking about it in terms of sheaves instead of thinking about it in terms of logic. So in our example uh, of Go, a lower real would assign a number to every open, to every rectangle. And when you take a sub rectangle, that number could go up. So maybe from here all the way to here, it doesn't have to go up, but it could go up. So it says the likelihood on this rectangle is nine, the likelihood on this rectangle is 15, 18, 12, 30, all this stuff. So it's just an increasing bunch of numbers, um, in this case between zero and one, but it's numbers. In the sheaf of, um, in the topos of sheaves on IR, a lower real again would define a, a, a lower semi-continuous function from IR to R. And that would mean that for every interval AB, I would get some number. And again, if I have a sub interval of a bigger interval, then the number would go up as I restrict. And finally, if I take, or a third condition is that if I take an interval and it's the intersection of some bunch of other intervals, then, uh, uh, then the number to that smaller interval is the soup of all the bigger, of all the numbers coming down towards it. Okay, so probability evaluation set theoretically, you have a topological space. It's a function from the opens to reals, such that when you, when you look at what it does on the empty set, you get zero. Um, this is supposed to be like a probability measure, but it replaces sigma additivity with something slightly different. So, um, or, or it's, got, it's, it's kind of a categorically nicer way of thinking about probability evaluations. So, it assigns false zero, it assigns true one, it's monotonic. So if U is a subset of V open, then mu of U is less than or equal to mu of V. Um, and this modular law Boss talked about, um, it says that it's, a, it's an inclusion exclusion thing. It says that if you have two open sets, U and V, and you add up how big they are, or the measures of U and V, um, and subtract off the measure of the intersection, you would get the measure of the union. So it's kind of telling you that this really must be about volume in some way. Um, or measure in some way. And finally, for any directed subset, which means that um, if you like the words co uh, filtered co-limit, that would be what this is, or um, basically that uh, a directed subset means that it's non-empty, and if you have any two opens in there, then there's some bigger open, maybe their union, or maybe something bigger than their union that's also in the D thing. And so what Scott Continuity says, um, our final axiom, is that the soup for any directed subset of the valuations of U is the valuation applied to the union of those um, open subsets. Okay, so I'm a little low on time, so I'll keep going. Um, so on the topos uh, uh, sheaves on Go, the sequences, seq was lower reals, uh, sorry, sequences was uh, legal move sequences and lower reals are functions that are uh, increasing as you make the rectangle smaller. And so evaluation, let's just look at this thing here. It says that when you, when you look at this sequence of you know, black being in the corner and white invading and black extending and all that sort of stuff, um, the likelihood of this, and I just made this number up, let's say it's 1%. Uh, but when you zoom in and you look at the exact same sequence, you restrict it, you see the same sequence happening, but now it's 4%. This could happen anywhere on the board or it could happen with lots of different contexts. Here, I forget that anywhere on the board thing, that would be some other, we would need some notion of uh, um, uh, isomorphism between different rectangles for that. But anyway, you could, you could do that. 
but it's much more likely to see this 4% than it is to see this. And if you just look at the bottom part, this sequence, maybe that's 15% of all, of all Go games, uh, when you look at that part of the board, have that sequence in them. Um, so to me, this looks pretty good because it's like for evaluation mu, we seem to be getting, uh, being able to look at different story snippets on different parts of the board and see how likely they are. Um, but uh, implicitly, it seems like we're imagining that the value that these numbers here, this 1% is part of evaluation that takes into account all possible things here and, um, and gives us the likelihood and that they'd add up to 100%, for example. But does that work? I mean, so far, we've just defined the valuation set theoretically and applied our sheaf whistle. And there's no reason to expect, I mean, there's reason to hope because of of past thinking and, and work and, and confidence that builds in this internal language, but there's no reason to know, we don't know that when we blow that sheaf whistle uh, that we will get the right notion of valuation or one that feels like it makes sense. So that's what uh, Tobias and I have been working on. Um, the question is under what conditions do valuations have understandable semantics? And so we need to choose some axioms on our topos, which is a bit of an art, maybe it would have understandable semantics to uh, a supercomputer in the future or something, but um, we, we want to prove something sensible and we want to do it in such a way that we have just a few axioms so they're not just, you're not overburdened by thinking about how many there are, uh, that they're all semantically meaningful, and that they're all logically simple. That's kind of um, what the art is about. So for us, the axioms on our topos are that there is this type of points, like the rectangles, we can talk about them internally and that every point gives us a modality. Um, and that these points are what are called Boolean subtoposes. They say that for any prop and any point, either the proposition is true at the point or the proposition tells you you're not even at the point, like P or not P kind of thing. Um, the second thing is that there are enough points for any proposition if you knew that for every point, the proposition was true at that point, then you would know the proposition was true throughout. Um, that's an axiom you need. And uh, um, in other words, that is not always true in all toposes. And the third is that the natural numbers are specialization flabby in the sense that um, if you have a proposition, if you have a predicate on naturals and a point, then, and you knew that at the point there is a, a natural making the proposition true, then there's a natural uh, globally uh, such that the proposition is true at the point. Okay, so if with these axioms, um, we can get going. So think of an internal space XOX as a space, topological space mapping to T. Uh, for every point T in T, we'll get a fiber, a subspace over that point, X sub T. And if I have T is a subset of T prime, then based on how the et al space works, you get a continuous restriction map from x of t to x of t prime. Uh, evaluation mu from O of x to R written logically or, or yeah, uh, induces a family of valuations at these fibers. And basically they're maps from the sheafification of OX to the sheafification of the lower reals, but you don't have to know what that means really. Basically, we're just getting valuations at every point. And this family is compatible with, with restrictions. Um, if I restrict and apply the valuation, I get the, I, um, I'll see the, the answer at the smaller thing. And uh, it's also lower semi-continuous. So for all U in O of X, um, any open set, uh, mu of U applied to Q, def that defines a lower real. Okay, so the, this can be made precise internally and externally. And although we don't have a proof, uh, it's not complete, this is the theorem we believe to be true, that if you have a, an internal space and you restrict evaluation on X to a family of local valuations, this gives you a bijection between valuations um, on X written logically and those families of at local valuations that are compatible and lower semi-continuous. Okay. So, uh, the upshot is that um, 
the internal notion of evaluation on T has very reasonable semantics. It's basically like a measure space at every point such that specialization preserves the measure and having probability strictly greater than Q is an open condition. That's what I just said, basically. Um, so for Go, uh, every rectangle gets a probability distribution and uh, the likelihood of a sequence grows as the rectangle shrinks. Uh, there's no continuity condition for the Go, but in IR there is a continuity condition. And um, in terms of going back to stochastic processes, um, what a reasonable notion of points would be, would be like finite subsets or maybe closed intervals of the naturals, uh, the integers or the reals. And um, while the conjecture, if you read it, applies, what I said above for the real numbers, it's a bit boring. And the reason is that the specialization on points is totally trivial. So probability distributions at varying points would be uncorrelated. Um, so to summarize, valuations are alternative to measures and they have reasonable semantics. They're logical constructs and can be manipulated as such. And in spatial toposes, ones that satisfy the axioms we said, but also more generally, um, valuations are locally determined at points. Um, there's this technical condition about compatibility and local semi-continuity of the point valuations and how that induces a big evaluation globally. Um, but um, we expect that this formulation can treat all standard stochastic processes. So the main idea is that to get correlations, we need to use a post set of points and the probability of an event increases under restriction. Um, so this sort of idea here. Uh, and so back to stories, something very mundane, just the very like sounds coming out of my mouth at a very micro level, um, become novel when you look in a larger context. So thanks. Well, thank you, David. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, <clears throat> if there are any questions, we have uh, about uh, 15 minutes for questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, so first I do want to say thank you for that. That, that was really fantastic. And I had a lot of aha moments, so I appreciate it. Um, but I wanted to ask about Go I know that it's more of an example, um, but have you considered the consequences of Co? Would you have to forbid that for this to work? Yeah, so I, I, um, in, uh, I said legal sequences. So I guess you're saying that something globally legal could look illegal. Yeah, yeah so there's also, <laughs> I don't actually know that we can, you can probably make this work. You would just say like, uh, if you're not looking at the whole board, then you have to consider things to be legal. Uh, okay. if, as long as you can't falsify that they're legal. It seems that when I, when I look at these things, I usually have to use a falsifiability semantics, like mm. uh, because if something's gonna be true globally, it has to be true locally. So if mm. something's legally globally, it has to be legally, legal right. okay. globally. So you have to sort of- Go is, go is like, for those who don't know, Go is kind of like castling. You can, uh, co, sorry, <laughs> in the sense that, um, as long as like certain things haven't happened, you can do it, you can do a move, but if there are other things have happened, you can't, it's that, that sort of thing. Um, it's not local, is that the idea? It's that you're not allowed to repeat a board position is really the idea. Um, if something happens where you could go back and forth each capturing each other, then they want to forbid that and it causes some really interesting uh, things. Yeah, it sort of, it puts in a fail safe delay in a way where when you have a repetition like that, you're forced to play somewhere else on the board before you can recapture something. Mm -hmm. And that avoids you from, you know, just spinning back and forth. Yeah. By the way, this is a little bit of an advertisement for anyone who wants to play Go at a future conference or even online. But... <laughs> well, we could very uh, start online Go later. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fun. Yeah, email me if you want to play. I'm 4Q, which is like negative. A black belt is called one Don and I'm negative. He, he, I would let, the, the black belt would let me uh, punch him four times in a row before we started. Um, anyway, so, so uh, uh, yep. I have a related question. Yep. Hey, Joaquin. Go, go for it. Yes, uh, first of all, that was beautiful. That's uh, really amazing to see all these fancy concepts and then just something like uh, Go. Uh, so continuing with Go, 
I mean, the notion of legal sequence is a global property, not a local. I mean, locally, it would look like black could put several stones in a row. Yeah. So if, so for example, it may look like black has captured in, in this sequence here. Uh, it looks like maybe white has captured black in the sense that black is totally surrounded, but it's not because it has these outside liberties. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have to just be, you have to say, well, I mean, maybe there are subtleties and maybe you really can't do this, but what, what's, can you say more about what you're worried about, Joachim, about... Um, okay, so globally, black and white have to alternate. But if you just look at a small local picture, that they don't be. have to alternate. Oh, good point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's terrible, isn't it? So, <laughs> so it's possible. Um, yeah, that's right. Okay. So I don't know what what a legal sequence would be. First of all, what one thing we do know is that you there you'll never see two stones appearing in a row, like at the same time. So maybe all legal sequence would be is. Uh, is just a list where no two things appear at the same time. And for the whole board, it would be legal in the usual sense. What if you took, what if you uh, sort of restricted any, um, so you take all the, the global um, allowable yeah. sequences and then you just restrict to the ones that- Yeah, that's the easiest thing, isn't it? Right. So you take the, yeah, that's right. So if you play so outside of a, if you play outside of, of a rectangle, it's like passing inside the rectangle. That's right. That's true. Yeah. But I did want, I wasn't sure whether to make this three passes or two, you know, two passes on this bottom line here, or just have it be the sequence from black to white. And I, I have to admit, I didn't think very hard about whether you could really make this work, but I figure with enough ingenuity, one could find the right um, uh, sheaf here. You presumably have to have a repeat. You just repeat the first one. Yeah, you could. Yeah. I have a question. Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering how this is related to the work by um, Steve Vickers and also my work with uh, Jericho Carr. So we, we did a constructor version of um, um, uh, the valuations inside the topples and so I remember looking at that at some point. Um, yeah. Steve, Steve Vickers emphasized that this construction is actually geometric. So that should make it a lot easier to compute what's happening, compute the interpretation. So you can just compute the interpretation point wise. And we actually made quite a bit of use of this in our work on, um, on quantum theory, on glorification. So the, um, the, for the Scott continuity and the directedness, um, that doesn't look obviously like a geometric notion. Uh, so Steve shows that this, this can be done. So what I, I just looked up the precise definitions. Um, so Steve shows preservation of directed joints or, or requires presentation of directed joints and that one's geometric. So, sorry, so preservation of directed joints to say that internally, doesn't that require you just to say, um, isn't directedness itself a non-geometric condition? Uh, let's see. Uh, there, there might be an issue where we use presentations for this, and then it can be can be done. Interesting. Yeah. yeah I mean, this, Steve, Steve makes. A, I mean, it, it's a large part of his paper to show that it's actually geometric. And the the follow-up question, and and that holds completely. General, so I'm, I'm wondering where you're using these three axioms because the construction you get for locales, then um, it's not clear to me where they're needed. We we uh, invented them as things that helped us um, in our proof. We're not saying that they're necessary. Um, maybe Tobias, I don't know if Tobias wants to jump in and, and say anything, but. Um, can you just for the, give me this, the reference for the Vickers paper? It's in uh, Zulip. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, we'll look into that and um, appreciate you. It's, it's, I remember seeing it and, and uh, being surprised that somehow, uh, and not knowing whether it was, it was actually uh, 
supposed to be um, true in all, like I wasn't sure because, because, because it was, the, the directedness didn't seem like a, um, a geometric condition. I was a bit surprised, I think, and not sure if I, if I was reading it right. And I mean, uh, there are indeed some, some variations. So mm -hmm. it's, it's possible that uh, um, you need to work somewhere with presentations, but then the points will be the same. Mm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. But thanks for the nice talk. Any, any more questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Peter. Um, is there an internal way of stating the Markov property or saying that your know, next step only depends on the last end step? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Tobias and I were just discussing that uh, a few weeks ago. Um, I think we wrote down a candidate. The problem is that, like the internal language is, is really cool. And as you, as you yourself well know, uh, in that you can say so many things, but sometimes you have many different ways of saying uh, the same thing. And you can't be quite sure that what you just said means what you want it to mean semantically. So um, there are many ways you could try to write down the markup condition. And then <laughs> the question is, which of them mean what you want? Okay, thanks. Maybe there's something uh, additional to be said concerning also Vasa's question. Um, so, so, yeah, we definitely have to log into that. And I personally am relatively new to Tofu's theory and didn't actually know what a geometric theory is. Um, but one reason for why we also want to have the modality, so why we want to have internal access to the points, is precisely to be able to talk about things like this Markov conditions. Um, and so then to have a way of talking about how things to, to be able to make reference to time uh, even, even internally. Just does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Any other questions? Well, if there are no other questions, then we should uh, thank David once again in the usual way. A round of applause.